Hello, this video is going to cover the hydrolysis of sucrose reaction. So, as you can see on my screen here, I have a glucose molecule and the anomeric carbon of the glucose molecule. So the carbon that's binded to two oxygens, one within the ring, one's often an alcohol functional group, but it could be linking to a different ring, which is the case here. This anomeric carbon is an alpha anomeric carbon. So if the oxygen was here, it'd be beta. If the oxygen's down or on the opposite side of the CH2OH, it is alpha. So we have um, glucose and we have fructose. Fructose, on the other hand, is the anomeric carbon is in the beta position. So in this case, the oxygen's on the same side as the CH2OH, and so this is beta fructose. Um, that being said, these two are linked together, so actually this compound here is sugar. So we are going to do the hydrolysis of sugar and walk through the mechanism for the hydrolysis of sugar. So hydrolysis means that we're going to be breaking a bond somewhere, and overall we're going to be adding water. This is an acid catalyzed mechanism, which means we need to be under acidic conditions. We only need enough acid, though, for essentially the first reaction to happen, and you'll see that we reproduce the acid as the reaction goes. So for this mechanism, um, let's find a convenient arrow here. We are first going to protonate the oxygen that links these two sugars together. After we protonate it, it'll be a good leaving group, and then we can kick that oxygen off. So we're going to attack that hydrogen of our acid, and then that bond is going to break, and we're going to form water as well as the protonated version of this. So I'm just going to copy this over and paste it right here. We have a remarkably similar structure, but now we have an extra bond on that oxygen. So we are protonated there, and we have a positive charge on this oxygen. And just to make this look a little bit better, I'm going to scoot that hydrogen back in. So now we have protonated the oxygen, linking the two sugars together, and what we've done is make a good leaving group. So the next step is to kick off our good leaving group. So we could do this either way. We could take the lone pair from fructose, um, the oxygen within the ring of fructose, and we could form the double bond and then kick off that oxygen. Or we could take the oxygen within glucose come down to form the double bond and kick off that oxygen. Um, so I'm going to, like I said, take a lone pair from the oxygen, come down, form a double bond, and then kick off my leaving group, which is my protonated oxygen. And what that formed now is fructose as well as almost glucose. And we'll see what that almost means in just a second. So we definitely have fructose at this point. So I'm going to copy that, paste it there. The electrons went to the oxygen. So we only had one hydrogen attached. ChemDraw automatically drew another one, so we'll just delete that. We no longer have a positive charge there because these electrons from that bond there neutralize that positive charge. So fructose is one of our products, and the other is something similar to glucose, but we don't have that there. We have a double bond right here. And our hydrogen's hanging out right there. And our ring is a little bit uncomfortable because now we have um, still a closed ring, so a pretty tight bond angle here, even though this is an sp2 hybridized carbon. And the only thing I missed there was the positive charge. All right, so our byproduct of that previous reaction was water. So let's go ahead and draw that in. H2O, and 
and we'll make that a subscript. And we also have a very electrophilic carbon. So our oxygen has a positive charge. Our electrophilic carbon is right here. So our water can come in and attack. Now, since this is sp2 hybridized, it can come from the top or come from the bottom just as easily. I'm going to just show what's convenient based on my drawing arrows and say it's going to attack right there. And then these electrons are going to go right up there. And that will get us to our next compound. which is this structure here. So now we have no longer that positive charge in the oxygen, we're neutral. We have a single bond in the ring and our water came in and attacked. So now we have a bond between this carbon here and water. We actually have two different products that formed. So we have our OH2 here, and we have our hydrogen here, and we have a plus charge on our oxygen, and then our other product is similar to this, and place that right there, H2. And then we'll make this one H and the positive charge is on there. So in the last step of this mechanism, then we would deprotonate our OH2 plus to make it OH. And for this compound here, we would be reforming our alpha D glucopyranose. So alpha, the glucopyranose and for this one we would be making beta D glucopyranose and again that's after we actually deprotonate this to make this an OH and deprotonate that to make it an OH all right so that is the hydrolysis mechanism um, for the hydrolysis of sugar. Like I said, our fructose could have kicked this off just as easily. So I only drew this product here for fructose, but we actually have two variations of that as well. So the other variation of this would be Um, essentially flipping the OH and CH2OH, where this would be CH2OH, and this would be OH. So those are our two products. And again, looking at this, so our, our alcohol functional group is on the opposite side of the CH2OH here. So this is our alpha D fructose. And here our OH is on the same side as the CO2OH, so this would be our beta D fructose. So I'm going to go ahead and draw that, beta D fructose, and this is our alpha D fructose. And one more time, just to clarify this, I just hate to have it mislabeled, I'm just going to deprotonate these, but make sure you show it in your mechanism for that last step. So essentially show water deprotonating your OH2 plus to make more H3O plus, which again specifies that we just need a catalytic amount of our acid to let this reaction go as long as we're under acidic conditions. For this experiment, we are going to look at the observed rotation of sucrose as well as the observed rotation of our hydrolyzed products, glucose and fructose, 
to measure the success of the reaction. For the specific rotation, we are going to measure the observed value with our instrument. So the alpha observed will be measured. The length of the decimeter or the length of the path that we're going to be looking is going to be two decimeters for this specific instrument. And the concentration will vary based on essentially how we make our solution. Using these, we can calculate the specific rotation, and the specific rotation has a literature value we can compare that to. The specific rotation for sucrose is 66.37 degrees. So based on our observed rotation, our concentration of solution, and length of the decimeter, we can calculate a specific rotation and compare that specific rotation to the known specific rotation of sucrose. First, as we saw in the equation, we need to know the weight of what we're analyzing for the optical rotation. So right now, I'm measuring out sucrose. So we are going to assess the weight of the sucrose in our solution. And next, we need to dissolve sucrose in an aqueous solution. So I have 40 milliliters of water in that beaker, and I'm adding all of the sucrose that we measured out to get that to fully dissolve before we assess the optical rotation. It took a while for all of that sugar to dissolve, but now that it has, we can go ahead and transfer that to our volumetric flask. I originally started out with less than 50 milliliters because we need to reach exactly 50 milliliters in our volumetric flask. So first I'm going to transfer all of that solution into the volumetric flask. And now I'm going to fill that volumetric flask with water, but I want to be able to make sure that I rinse that out so all of that sugar, so all of that measured sugar actually goes into the volumetric flask as well. So if we were to just fill, we would be losing some of that sugar there, so we'd actually have slightly less concentration than assumed. And when filling this volumetric flask, you can see a small line that I'm about to reach. We want the bottom of the meniscus to be touching that line. From this angle, it looks like it's pretty close, but if you actually look down level with it, the bottom of the meniscus is slightly below the line. So I've added two more drops there, so the bottom of the meniscus is touching that line. Now our goal here is to measure the optical rotation, so we need to transfer some of that solution into the pathway that we're going to be looking down through this liquid to see the actual optical rotation of it. So this is a two decimeter pathway that we're going to be looking through. This will make a little bit more sense since we put it into the instrument. Um, it's referred to as a cell, so we have a two decimeter length cell. and it's essentially um, a glass plate on both sides. So we're looking through glass within the glass container. Now that this is mixed thoroughly, it's got equal concentration everywhere. 
Unfortunately, the neck of those volumetric flasks is a little bit too narrow to pour out, which is a little bit inconvenient. So we're going to have to just transfer with a plastic pipette. At this point, I'm going to slightly overfill it, and the reason why is because once I push that um, glass plate on it, we don't want an air bubble in there. So if you see, if you have an air bubble in there, you're not going to be able to actually read it, and again, that'll make more sense as you look in the instrument, but it's best to have pretty much no air bubble. So I've actually taken that glass plate out and let some of that liquid overflow so there's absolutely no air present in that, um, in that chamber. And now we can take this over and put it in the device. And turn the backlight on it. And the part that I'm looking through right now looks right through that cell. When you look through that, so you can see through the phone here, the camera will zoom in a little bit. Right now, when you look through it and it's set at zero, it's actually pretty bright on the left side, but a little bit more dark on the right side. And then I will zoom in again to the dot. As we slowly turn it, we reach equal brightness on both sides at a certain point. And, and then on the instrument, we can look up and see the number of degrees that we actually rotated it to reach that equal brightness. So for this measurement, if you look closely at where that zero line at the bottom is, that's looking at the scale. So from the top zero, that um, range goes actually from zero to negative 90 and zero to positive 90. We're definitely on the positive side. We're between zero and 10. And our zero mark is right at 3.5. So if we use that within our equation, our specific optical rotation equals 3.5, which is the observed optical rotation, divided by the concentration of our solution, which is the amount we weigh divided by 50 milliliters, and then multiplied by 2 because that's the path length. So you can solve that and solve for the specific rotation, and then you can compare that to the known specific rotation for sucrose. For the next part of the experiment, we are going to take 6.9 grams of sugar and we are going to add that to an aqueous solution. And then we are going to add hydrochloric acid, specifically 6 milliliters of hydrochloric acid, <clears throat> to that solution and heat it up. Adding that acid, will catalyze the hydrolysis reaction, <clears throat> which will convert sucrose into glucose and fructose. So for this reaction, we want to reflux this for 30 minutes. Instead of using a condenser and a round bottom flask heater, we decided to do it in this uh, beaker. Um, you can see that the watch glass is actually holding some of that condensation. And through the reaction, I continuously um, mixed it with the pipette, especially to get everything to dissolve. And then once it started refluxing, as you can see here, it was condensing on the glass and falling right back down. And if we were to lose a little bit of water, it's not that big of a deal. So that was refluxing for 30 minutes until we stopped it. Um, and we knew that we were going to backfill with a little bit of water anyway to get it back to 50 milliliters. So the exact volume wasn't crucial um, since we needed to transfer it to that uh, volumetric flask anyway. So at this point, what we have is glucose and fructose, hopefully. So we're going to assess the optical rotation to make sure that happened. 
And when we think about doing the optic rotation and assessing that, we need to convert 6.9 grams of sucrose into moles. Because our mass of glucose plus fructose will not equal 6.9 grams either. Since we added water, I expect the weight to be slightly higher. Once you have moles of sucrose, you can convert moles of sucrose into moles of glucose and moles of fructose because all are at a one-to-one -one ratio. Once you have moles of both fructose and glucose, you can convert those into grams. And your total mass, like I said, is probably going to be slightly higher than 6.9. But you need the total mass of both because that is going to be used within your optical rotation calculation. So you're going to add both the theoretical mass of glucose and fructose, assume that's what we got in the experiment, so assume we got full conversion, and that is going to be the total weight of product that we're analyzing. So we're mixing an equal mass of fructose and glucose, and that's what we're analyzing for optical rotation. When looking at the theoretical values for glucose and fructose, glucose is 52.7, fructose is negative 92. So our theoretical optical rotation is going to be the average of those two. So add them together and divide by two, and that's what we expect our value to be for our specific rotation. We filled that into the um, two decimeter polarimeter cell just like we did for the last reaction and we're going to look and assess the optical rotation of that 50 milliliters of solution which hopefully is at a one-to-one -one ratio of glucose and fructose. So originally when I looked in there down the polarimeter cell it was not equally bright on both sides and at this point, I actually slowly turn it in the negative direction. So based on my calculation, I got a, um, I'm expecting a negative value for my theoretical value. So I slowly turn it until we got equal brightness on both sides, which looks like this. And from here then, we can simply look up and see what that actual rotation is reading. And as you can see, our experimental value is negative 5.5. So our zero goes just before the five in our zero to negative 10 range. So negative 5.5 is our observed or experimental optical rotation.